Welcome back, mathletes. So last week we were working on multiplying with decimals, but we used whole numbers. So it'd be like if you went to the grocery store and something had a cost of $2.79, but you had a repeated cost because you bought five of them, we would need to multiply the cost by five. Today we're working with taking pieces of pieces with decimals multiplied by more decimals. We still need to multiply just like we do with whole numbers and then place a decimal in our answer. And then we can still use estimation. We'll just need to round both numbers or find some compatible numbers that work quickly for you. So I want you to think back to chapter two when we multiplied fractions with fractions. And we know that with a fraction, seven tenths multiplied by one tenth, we multiply across and we would have done seven times one and 10 times 10 and came up with seven out of 100. Well, seven tenths as a fraction looks like a 0 0.7 as a decimal because this also says seven tenths because the seven is living in the tenths place. One tenth in its decimal form looks like 0 0.1 because it's a one in the tenths place. So in chapter four, we will convert or change fractions to decimals and decimals back to fractions because they both represent parts. Sometimes in life, we like our part to look fractiony, maybe like in a recipe, but sometimes we prefer our part to be um, decimal looking and that would be more like money. So if seven hundredths was the answer as a fraction, then the answer is still seven in the hundredths place as a decimal. But we don't want to have to convert all of our decimals into fractions first before we multiply them. So there's a much faster way for us to do this. I want you to look at these and see if you can figure out how they knew where to put the decimal. Because multiplying the numbers is pretty easy. If they all have a two and they all have a three, two times three is always six. But notice that as the decimal changed in the problem, the decimal also found a new location in the final answer. And we use a bunch of zeros to keep shifting that uh, number over and over and over and over and over and putting it into a new spot on the place value chart. So I want you to study this. Where do you think, or what do you think the answer would be for the very last one? Well, you'll find out today <clears throat> that when we multiply with decimals, we do just multiply the digits together, and then it becomes a counting game. When there's one decimal spot in the problem, the answer matches with one. But the next problem had this one and this one, tenths with more tenths. So we have two in our answer to match. When the problem had hundredths and tenths together, that means thousands because tenths times hundredths is thousands. Three spots over there. When the problem had four spots, two there and two more there, the answer also had four spots. So if this problem has one, two, three, four, five, six, our answer also needs six spots. The first spot here doesn't count because it's not on the decimal side or the right side of that decimal point. But now I need one, two, three, four, five, six spots. And the six is going to be at the very end. If I don't put the six at the very end, then it's really going to be like a 0 0.6 which is this answer. And we don't want it to be that answer because it's not this problem. So the six will be way over there and all the other spaces would be filled in with zeros because taking two thousandths of three thousandths is a very small, tiny amount. So let's see if we can figure out where does the decimal go? Pause the video while you um, figure out where the decimal goes. Choose one of these to try. So if we look, we've got a counting game here. We've got one, two, three. 
So our answer would be over one, two, three. It's gonna go in between the one and the zero, making this one and 52 thousandths. This problem had one, two, three. Our answer also needs one, two, three. So you can kind of like swoop it in, uh, you know, from, from the left side, move it, move it, move it uh, kind of on over. Sorry, that would be your right. <clears throat> um, problem C, each of those twos is in a decimal location, but also the six and the three are. That's five spaces total. So I'm going to move it in five spaces. One, two, three, four, five. On a 9.77 times 5.4, there are um, tenths and hundredths and more tenths, which is three spots total. So this is going to be 52-ish as an answer. On letter E, there's one, two, plus one more is three. We're going to go one, two, three with that. And then on the last one here, one, two spots there, but three spots over there and two decimal spots and three more decimal spots means five decimal spots. So we're going to move it in one, two, three, four, five. And if we estimate it, this is about a 10. This is about a two. 10 times two real fast is 20. The only spot the decimal can go that's close to 20 would be after the 18. If we moved it anywhere else, it would be one point something, which is not close to 20, or 181 point something, which is not close to 20. So we can also use estimation to help us figure out where does the decimal go? So how exactly then do we multiply with decimals? Let's make sure we completely understand. I want you to look at textbook page 120 kind of look through what they show you and tell you and see if you can figure out exactly the steps or the process for multiplying decimals with more decimals. We'll pause the video while you look to learn. So just to make sure that what you think you've discovered about multiplying decimals is true, we're gonna use another resource. I have a video here um, from Math Antics on YouTube, and we're gonna check and see exactly how do we multiply decimals with more decimals. Take it away, Rob. Decimal multiplication. Now, as you know, multi-digit multiplication is more complicated because there are so many multiplication steps. But the good news is that decimal numbers don't really make the procedure much harder than it is with whole numbers. That's because there's a clever way that we can make decimal multiplication look exactly like the multi-digit multiplication with whole numbers that you already know how to do. The key is to pretend that the decimal points are not really there. Hold on a minute. I mean, I like pretending as much as you do, but if we just pretend that the decimal points aren't even there, we aren't going to get the right answer, are we? Well, no, but the only thing that will be wrong with the answer is that the decimal point won't be in the right spot. So we'll need to fix that at the end. I know it sounds a little confusing, so here's an example that should help you understand. I knew you would say that. Let's say that you need to multiply 3.65 by 2.4. Now that seems a little tricky, but what if we just pretend that the decimal points are not there for now? In other words, what if we pretended that the numbers were 365 and 24? You already know how to do that problem. You would just follow the procedure that we learned in multi-digit multiplication, part two, and you'd get the answer 8,760. But that's the answer to 365 times 24, not 3.65 times 2.4. So it's time to stop pretending. To get the correct answer for the decimal problem, we've got to understand what's going on with those decimal points and why we just pretended they weren't there. The truth is, when we pretended that the decimal points weren't there, what we were really doing is pretending that they had been shifted until both of our numbers became whole numbers. Remember, the numbers 365 and 24 technically do have decimal points. They're right there next to the ones place. We just don't need to show them since there aren't any decimal digits. So by ignoring the decimal points, what we were really doing is mentally shifting the decimal points to the right. We shifted the top decimal point two places to the right and we shifted the bottom decimal point one place to the right. But doing that changed the numbers. It made the top number 100 times bigger than the decimal version, and it made the bottom number 10 times bigger. 
That's because every time you shift the decimal point one number placed to the right, it's like multiplying by a factor of 10. And that means the answer we got is way too big. It's too big by three factors of 10 because the decimal points in our problem got shifted a total of three places to the right, two on the top and one on the bottom. So to fix that, we're going to have to shift the decimal point in our answer the same amount in the opposite direction. In other words, we need to move the decimal point in our answer three places to the left, which will make it smaller by three factors of 10. So starting right here, where the decimal point would be if our answer was 8,760, we shift it three places to the left, and we end up with 8.760, or just 8.76. And that is the answer to 3.65 times 2.4. That's a cool trick, huh? It means that you can do decimal multiplication just like regular multi-digit multiplication. You start by setting up your multiplication problem exactly like you would if the decimal points were invisible. But don't just erase them because you'll need them at the end to figure out how many places to shift the decimal point in the answer. Then keep ignoring the decimal points while you follow the multiplication procedure. Once you have an answer, count up how many places the decimal points are shifted in the problem you're working. Don't forget, it's the total shift of both the top and bottom decimal points. And then shift the decimal point in your answer to the left that same number of places. So decimal multiplication turns out to be not too bad after all. But what about... So we can see by the video here that um, it's a lot like what we've already been doing. The only difference is we'll be counting our total decimal places um, and then swooping it into our answer. So you do have notes. It's the same steps as we did when we multiply decimals with whole numbers. You just multiply the numbers. Pretend like those decimals are not even there. And then it becomes a counting game. Count the total places that are in the problem. And then the answer needs the same amount. So sometimes we'll move our decimal over, over, over so much that we have empty spaces. They might only have numbers here and here. And if that's the case, we'll need to fill in the empty spot with a placeholder zero. That way we remember that this problem has tenths, it's just no tenths. We can still do our estimation to check that we multiplied okay and that our decimal is in a good spot. Because as we shift the decimal around, if we get it in the wrong spot, our answer should be off by quite a bit. So estimate to check and make sure that you're good. Here's an example on the screen where they've multiplied. That was our step one. They did a three one times a five nine and they came up with all of their information going on there. Then uh, step two, they did a counting game. Then step three, they moved it into the answer. And then step five here, there were no extra zero spaces needed. They did an estimation. About three times about six is about 18. And so we come up with our answer. I'm gonna walk you through this one here. I'm gonna do a three, two, one multiplied by a four. I'm gonna keep this up here though so that I can look back at the end and figure out where are the decimals. Um, that way I don't have to draw them into my problem and confuse myself. So just like whole digit numbers, four times one is four, four times two is eight, and four times three is 12. I don't have another row because I don't have another value. If I used the zero, multiplying by a bunch of nothing would just fill this row with zeros and it's really just a time waster. So if I don't need to because zero has no value, it's not gonna change my answer anyways. I might as well quit now. Now that I've multiplied, I'm ready to count. I'm gonna count how many places of digits are in the problem. There's one, two there and one more there. And so two and one makes three total. So in my answer, I need to move it in three total. And remember he said, slide it to the left. So one, two, three spots over, my decimal will sit and stay there. 
So we end up with a 1.284 as the answer to this problem. And if I estimated three groups of about 50 cents is like $1.50, and a 1.284 is pretty close to that $1.50 amount. If my decimal were too far over, it would have been um, like 12 cents. If my decimal didn't go far enough, it would be here at 12-ish, and that's nowhere close to that. Give you one to try here. We'll pause the video while you work. So when you multiply a 289 times 3, the digits that you come up with would have been an 8, 6, 7. But there's no way that $2.89 multiplied by 3 tenths is 867. So now we need to count and place the decimal. In the problem, there's 1, 2, 3 total. So the answer also needs 1, 2, 3 total. We're going to drop that there. Now you can place a filler zero here in the ones place to remind yourself it's not whole dollars at all. It's just small pieces. And then an estimate to check. Three groups of about 30 cents is less than a dollar, be about 90 cents, and that's pretty close to 90 cents. How'd you do? Did you multiply your digits okay? Did you get that decimal moved over three times? Here's my next example. This is kind of like a double digit multiplied by a double digit. So I need to think about how do I multiply double digit numbers by other double digit numbers. So six times five is 30. Six times two is 12 plus three more. That digit's done. I'm gonna move on to my next digit here, but I'm gonna put my placeholder zero because I'm shifted over a spot. That way everything lines up underneath this. Three times five, three times two is six plus one more is seven. Add it back together. And I get 900, that's a zero. Well, I know 900 is not the answer. So if I'm thinking about this, I need to place my decimal. One spot there, one spot there, is two spots total. So my answer needs one, two spots total, making it really just nine. I can estimate this to be about three. This is about four or about three. Three times four is 12, three times three is nine, and nine is exactly the number. So I know that I'm pretty close. Give you one to try. We'll pause the video while you multiply these decimals together. So if you multiply correctly and have that placeholder zero in row two, your digits should have been a one, seven, six, eight. Did you multiply okay to get a one, seven, six, eight? Now, I need to place that decimal. So tenths and tenths multiplied together are hundreds. This number needs tenths and hundreds, dropping the decimal point there between the seven and the six. So if we estimate it, this is about five, and this is about three, and five times three is about 15. Well, it is 15. And 15 is pretty close to 17-ish, which means this is my answer, 17 and 68 hundredths. How'd you do? Did you multiply okay? Did you get that decimal in the right spot? So my next one has lots of zeros in it. So I'm gonna pretend like the decimals aren't even there and I'm just gonna focus on these numbers. Five times three, and I know that's 15. Now, I'm ready to count and place my decimal. So this has one spot, tenths, but this number has one, two, three spots. It has tenths, hundredths, and thousands. Even though the tenths and hundredths don't have value to them, they're still part of the decimal placement. So I need four total, one for this side and three for this side. My answer is gonna need four total places. One, two, three, four. In order to keep this 15 shoved way over there on the other side, I need to fill some zeros. So remind yourself that these spots are taken. 
Otherwise, it's going to look like 15 cents, and we really have no cents. Um, this is less than a penny. It's so tiny. So we have to fill in with those zeros, and you can even put a zero in the ones place because there's no whole dollars either. We can estimate to check it's like 50 cents times about nothing, and so that's why our answer is about nothing. Give you one like that to try. We'll pause the video while you work to multiply and then place a decimal. Remember, you'll need a lot of zeros. So a six times four is a 24, but we need to place a decimal in there. So if we count one, two, three, four total, our answer needs one, two, three, four total. So the decimal is going to sit right here. But these empty spaces that don't have any digits in them need filler zeros. Otherwise, the 2, 4 is going to slide on over and it's going to become 24 cents. To keep them way over there, we fill those empty places in with nothing. The decimal stays put and your ones place can also have a zero in it as well. Estimate to check. It's a small value times about nothing. So that's why your answer is really tiny with a lot of zeros. This one has even more zeros in it. So seven times nine is a 63. And now I'm gonna count one, two, three, four for that side. One, two, three for that side. I need seven total. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, way over there is where my decimal is going to end up. I better fill in all these empty spots with zeros to remind myself there's nothing there. You could put a zero in the ones place as well. This is very little value to it. It is so tiny. It would be, probably be microscopic in size if um, we put this into the real world. You try yours. So seven times five, you know, is 35, but this is definitely not 35 holes. So we need to place our decimal in here. So we're going to count one, two, three, four, five total. So my answer also needs one, two, three, four, five total before the decimal gets to settle in, settle on in. These empty spots need placeholder zeros and your one spot can get a zero as well. So this is tenths, hundredths, thousandths, ten thousandths, hundred thousandths. This decimal is 35 hundred thousandths, 35 out of a hundred thousand. That's a really small population. I see here that I'm at a restaurant and they have this buffet stand where I can take out a meal and the cost is $4.99 per pound, which means I only pay for what I take. So the more I take, the heavier the container will get and the more I'm going to pay. But the less it weighs, the less I'm going to pay. So if it doesn't weigh exactly one pound, then I won't pay exactly $4.99. This happens in the real world when you're shopping for things like fresh fruits and vegetables that aren't in a bag. They weigh them. And the more you purchase, the more you pay or sorry yeah the more you purchase because the heavier it would be there so uh, when apples are priced at a you know a dollar 67 per pound if you only bought one apple obviously it's going to be cheaper but if you bought a heavy apple because it was big and I bought a small apple um, and it weighed less I'm gonna pay less for my apple just because the size of it isn't as heavy so I see that my meal weighs 65 hundredths of the pound I'm going to pay with $5, how much change will I get back? Well, it depends. How much do I owe her or owe them? So I have to first figure out how much do I owe. And then I can take my payment, subtract what I owe, and then I'll know how much change I'm going to get back. So this is really a two-step equation. My first step is to figure out how much does my food cost? So because it is $4.99 per pound and my poundage is here, 
I'm going to pretend like my decimals aren't there, and I'm going to multiply a 499 times a 65. When I do all my good multiplication and my placeholder zeros, I come up with the numbers 3, 2, 4, 3, 5. But there's no way I'm paying $32,000 for some rice and chicken. So that's why I need a decimal in my answer. So I'm going to count. Tenths, hundredths for this number, tenths, hundredths for this number. That's four places. So my money is really one, two, three, four places over before my decimal gets to stay. Now I know that there's no such thing as a 0.2435 coin. So in the real world, when numbers come up to be weird like this, we chop them at the penny. If the digit next door is five or bigger, you're gonna pay a penny more. But if it's not, you get to ignore that extra bit. So because this is a three, I get to ignore and I don't have to worry about that value. So instead, my food is gonna cost me $3.24. But that doesn't answer the question. If I pay with $5, how much change do I get back? My change is not $3.24. $3.24 is what I owe. So I'm gonna take that number that I owe them and I'm gonna subtract it from the $5. And I need to do all that good borrowing. 10 take away four is six, nine take away two is seven, four take away three is one. I'll get back $1.76 after I've paid $3.24 for my food. We'll give you a story problem to try. Our question uh, for you is, is a dollar enough to buy 2.6 pounds of bananas? Explain how you know. We'll pause the video while you work this problem out. So if bananas are 39 cents per pound, 39 cents is really the decimal 39 hundredths. So this is the value of the bananas but it's for a full pound and we're buying more than one pound. So if you take the 26 and multiply it by the 39, you'll figure out what the cost of 2.6 pounds of bananas will be. And then you'll figure out if having a dollar is going to be enough money or not. If you did the multiplication good and you did this times this and this times this and a placeholder zero and this times this and this times this and all that put together, you would have come up with the digits one, zero, one, four. But there's no way you're going to pay a thousand dollars for a little bit of bananas. It's better be some good bananas if you do. So now we need to place a decimal in the answer. One decimal was here and the other decimal was here. So that makes one, two, three spots total. So your answer would need one, two, three spots total, making your bananas 1.014. But like in mine, if we have something that goes past the penny, we either pay a penny more and bump it up, or we get to ignore. And because it's a four, the rounding rule for four is forget about it. So $1 and one cent. But that's not the answer. The question was, is a dollar enough? So you can't say one dollar and one cent. Is a dollar enough? And because you, you have to pay a penny extra, you don't have enough money. But I bet if you walked around the grocery store long enough, you could find a penny on the floor. So now it's time for your practice. You'll be solving page 70 in your journal workbook. We're going to do questions one, two, three. Those are just some basic, here's some decimals, multiply them by some more decimals, do all your really good multiplication, count and place the decimal in your answer. And remember, use estimation to check and see that your answers are close and that you multiplied okay. You have to show your work. If you don't show your work, then I'm not giving you any credit until you do show your work. 10 and 11 are some story problems, so take your time on those um, as well. On number 11, there's some tax involved. And when you're purchasing something with tax, the rule is cost, once you know what it is, 
added with the tax, that's going to equal your total. If the question is asking you how much change do you get back, you'll need to subtract your total from the money that you paid with, and that will tell you your change that you get back. You can always look back at examples on textbook pages 120 121 if you need to. And just a reminder, we are uploading pictures of all of our work into Google Classroom for grading. If you get stuck, come on and see me during my office hours. And if not, happy practicing.